On today's photo moment, we're gonna be talking about one of my favorite lenses, the Noctocron 42.5 millimeter F1.2. Good morning and welcome to Photo Show Says Photo Moment, the first live three times a weekly show here on YouTube at uh, 9.30 a.m. Pacific, youtube.com slash photo Joseph. Takes you right here. If you're not already subscribed, hit that subscribe button, hit the little bell, you get notified when I go live, you don't miss a show. And you know, when you get to watch it live, you get to participate in the pre-show, which is just a few minutes of me telling bad jokes. But hey, sometimes they're funny. The audience is either laughing or yelling at me because I just triggered everybody's Google Home. Uh, and of course you can participate in the chat and participating in the chat means it looks like this. You can ask questions. If you've got a question for me, put the app photo Joseph in front of it. That way I can be sure to see it um, and know that uh, know that you're there and know that you have a question for me. And if you really, really have a really big question or you just love the show, there's that whole little super chat button. You can hit that thing too. But in the meantime, let's get on with the show, shall we? So today we are talking about the Noctocron. This is this is one of the Leica badged lenses, and uh, mine's got a little wear and tear on the outside. Of course, the glass is pristine. Let's get it. Let's actually get a little close up here of this thing because it is it is such a pretty lens. Very nice, solid metal construction. Um, big, huge front element. I just I just like oh, it's like a big swimming pool of glass there. You need like angels singing as you turn that. Oh, it's a beautiful lens. Nice, just big open. It's mechanical aperture, although well, not mechanical aperture. It's a stepped kind of quite. You can hear it quite nice, solid, firm, stepped aperture, which is not exactly what you want if you're doing video, but the lens is not designed for video. Now, that said, you can certainly use it for video. I've done a lot of cool video stuff with it. It's just not one of the ones that has the stepless aperture, but that's fine. Um, it does have the ring on the front, though. That's that's unique to the Leica badge lenses from Panasonic. So if you get one of the Leica ones, it has the ring on there. It's just much more traditional, I guess you would say, as far as being able to adjust the aperture on the camera while um, on the lens directly instead of having to hit one of the dials. So you've, you know, instead of doing aperture on one dial, shutter speed on another, you've got your aperture here. I really like it that way. I do. And if you don't, one of the cool things is that if you put the lens into, let's go back to the close up here. If you put the lens into A for, and you can kind of see it's, it's like, it, it goes along here and then it gets there and it, it kind of stops. You have to push quite a bit harder and it's a long slide over to A, and then it's really locked in there. It's, it's a very different feel. You know you're not going to accidentally go into A. You know when you've switched it into the A mode. And if you put it in the A mode, but then you're in manual exposure, you can still control the aperture with the dial up on top. So if you just prefer that you don't want to use the ring, you don't have to. You can put it in A mode and off you go. Uh, let's see what else about this lens. This lens does have uh, built-in optical image stabilization. So we've got the switches on the side here for that. Let's zoom a little bit closer in there and you can see. So we've got the OIS um, switches on the lens as well as the autofocus manual focus switch on the lens. One of those things to know if you're not used to having that, if you inadvertently bump that and then you're trying to turn manual focus on or off here, you may get kind of confused. This, this lens switch will, oops, wrong side. This lens switch will override what's on the back of the camera. So uh, if you put it in manual, it's gonna be manual. So just one of those things to be aware of. Uh, honestly, I don't use, I don't think I use the switch on the front, on the lens itself to go between autofocus and manual focus very often. I pretty much just do it from the back on the thumb, but you know, your mileage may vary, do whatever you like. OAS, parent, being able to turn your optical image stabilization on or off right there is of course, that's, that's great. If you really want it off, you can hit that off. But I barely turn that thing off. I pretty much leave that on all the time. So when you combine this lens with one of the more modern cameras that has the five axis stabilization inside and the dual, this lens does support the dual image stabilization. So you get some crazy levels of stabilization, which is awesome. And if you put this on a camera like the GH5S, which does not have stabilization in the body, you do still get stabilization in the lens. So, so that's that. So why would you want a lens like this and why would you spend this much money on it? Because it's not cheap. It's almost $2,000 lens. Um, I think eighteen or $1,900. It's, uh, it's not a cheap one, but it's beautiful. It is absolutely beautiful. So at f1.2, clearly it's some serious low light gathering capability. So if you're shooting really low light, having that huge aperture is going to be a big benefit. The other big benefit, of course, is shallow depth of field. And I'm going to show you a bunch of my favorite photos. I, pull, I went through the last couple of years worth of photos and, um, oops, what did I just do? I went through the last couple of years worth of photos, if I can figure out where I put Lightroom, and um, 
brought them in here. These are exports. These are already JPEGged out. These are my kind of my treatments, or some in some cases they're just JPEG straight out of camera. Uh, brought them in here so I can click around and show you a few different images and really show you how it performs in low light and also with that shallow depth of field, the really nice bokeh that you can get from it. Not just at really close distances. You're going to see some shots that are quite far away where we can still get a bit of that uh, that shallow depth of field. Obviously, getting that shallow depth, the getting that big bokeh is the challenge of the smaller sensor, right? We all know that the bigger the sensor, uh, the shallower the depth of field at any given aperture. So if you were to compare micro four thirds up to full frame, up to medium format, the depth of field dynamic changes dramatically. I remember it was, I bought a four, you can actually see it back there, kind of sort of, I got a four by five old film camera that I picked up just for giggles a while ago, it was a few years ago. I've only shot with it a couple of times, but I shot it, I wanna say the lens was F5.6 or even F8, and at that, the depth of field was crazy shallow. I was shooting a portrait, and I was like, whoa, okay, I forgot how much of a difference it makes when you go all the way up to four by five. So when you are shooting on the smaller sensors, having that really, really big aperture is important. That's what's gonna give you that shallow depth of field that we all love and adore, that look that we all covet so much. Uh, before I jump into the pictures, let's take a look at, uh, at the comments here real quick. And Brent is saying, uh, somebody said, where'd it go? Uh, Daddy MCC says, on sale at B&H for 1397. Ooh, I suppose I should have looked that up before we did the show. That's fantastic. I did not co time this to coincide with that, I promise. I had no idea. Okay, we will have links to that down below if they're not already there. Um, that's a really good price. Okay, if that is within your budget, man, highly recommend this lens for that. It's, that's a really good price, super. Brent says, when does the G9 ship? I think it's soon. I don't know, I don't keep track of these things. Um, oh, it started shipping already. The G9 started shipping. Yeah, the G9 was supposed to be shipping on the 15th and I knew some people got it. Wait, that's today. But some people got it last week. So it is now a shipping camera. Sorry. All right, let's move on. So let's, uh, Brent's is B&H 1697. Okay, we're getting some differences in there. Um, take a look at B&H. Take a look at Amazon too. They're usually price matching, so you can shop all over the place. Again, we'll put links down below. Okay, so let's take a look at a couple of photos. Let me, let's make this just a little bit bigger. Thumbnails here and Let's pull a few up. I'm gonna kind of bounce around. I don't have really a, a set order that I wanna show you the pictures, but we'll, we'll start with some portraits. How's that sound? All right. So, can I, let's see, I can't, I'm still getting used to the Lightroom, new Lightroom CC where I just dumped all this stuff. Let's start with one of my favorite pictures of all time. This is one of the, um, what, this is the picture that's used for the title card for this. Let's zoom into 100%. This, I just, I love this photo. So this is uh, a musician, um, God. Little Freddie King. This is Little Freddie King in New Orleans. I shot this back in, back when I was doing, now I'm trying to remember how to zoom out of, oh, good job, genius. There we go. Uh, I shot this when I did the GX85 production. So this is, this was shot on the GX85. This is a JPEG straight out of camera. And I know that for a fact because at the time that we shot these, there was no raw support for uh, for this camera. So all the pictures that I had to deliver from that shoot were all done with JPEG. So this is JPEG straight out of camera, set into black and white mode. I've talked about this before. I like shooting, I love shooting in black and white, and I always shoot raw plus JPEG. Uh, normally that would give me the ability to go back to the raw and reprocess it. At the time of this, I couldn't because there was no raw support. So I had to just use the JPEG that came out of the camera. But as you can see, I mean, this is probably, if not unretouched, virtually unretouched from the camera here. And you can see just how sharp that is and those eyebrows couldn't be any sharper. Um, <laughs> love the eyebrows. And look at the tip of his nose. It's totally soft. We have very, very shallow depth of field in there. And if we, can I pinch out of this? I'm, I guess not. Sorry, I'm just, I'm realizing I don't really know how to navigate very well. Oh, maybe one click will do it. There we go, one click will do it. Um, you can just see that incredible shallow depth of field. His hands all out of focus, the ring out of focus. Back behind him, his collar on his shirt's got that nice soft, soft book on it. But man, it just pops right in on the eyes there. I absolutely, absolutely love it. So that's, that is really one of my favorite all-time photos. I just I adore this picture. Okay, let's move on to something else. Uh, back, uh, okay, now how do I back out of that? Escape, there we go. So let's see here, let's go to same shoot. Um, Obviously not quite as formal. This is the, the artist Frenchie that we photographed there. You can see, okay, he's obviously making a face, uh, but even so shallow, probably too shallow, one eye in focus, the other eye out of focus, maybe a little bit a little bit too much. But here, using that same lens for 
Let's go here for something like this, photographing the artwork. So this is, again, this is Frenchie. That's his hand painting or adding some touch-up paint to this image. You can see there the, the big fall off down to the sharp point where his hand is. So his hand's what's in focus on there. This is one of the shots I wish that I'd had the brush against a lighter part of the image, but that's what he was, that's what he was retouching when we got there. So it is what it is. Uh, and then this one there, same setup, same environment. This is also Frenchie Studio. This is his assistant, I forget, or apprentice perhaps, I forget his name now. But again, focusing on the art that he's doing, these little tile tiles that he's adding to the mannequin back here, and a huge fall off to the foreground, to the um, uh, to our chap in the front there. So really nice, really nice fall off in there, really nice shallow depth of field. Here's a little bit more low light performance. This also on that GX85 productions. This is in New Orleans. Um, again, here, these are probably shot wide open. Yeah, this is wide open at F1.2. You can see quite a big fall off just from the front eye to the back eye. Uh, beautiful, beautiful shadows, shadow detail, nice rich blacks in here. The lens, the color rendering of this lens is gorgeous. I really, really have appreciated the colors you get out of it, the contrast you get out of it, obviously the sharpness and the shallow depth of field. But overall, it's really a lens that's tuned for portraits, and it's just just beautiful for it, just beautiful. I've seen some more questions coming up in there. We'll hit those when uh, when, when we kind of wrap some of this up here. Uh, let's see here, what else we got? It's just another photo of that chap there. It's kind of fun to be here. Look at that. Look at this super sharp on the eyelashes in there, uh, and nice fall off through the nose, and down to the mouth and the chin down there. It just looks really pretty. Uh, and then, let's see here, let's look at another example of different types of work. How about some kind of travel photography? Just casual out shooting some fun stuff in a, in a market. That's, here we go, that's what this is. This is, what camera is this? Uh, this is the GH4. This is a shot on the GH4. Uh, same lens, yep, f1.2, so wide open on here, hundredth of a second, high-ish, ISO, ISO 500. So this is one of those environments where it's indoors, there's not a whole lot of light. You know, all these lights here aren't putting out a huge amount of light, but being able to get that really nice shallow depth of field. So this is a JPEG out of camera as well. It's a little bit crunchy. The JPEG's a little crunchy. Probably should reprocess the RAW for this, but I I just, I like the, the colors, the look of this one out of the camera. And you can see there, big, huge fall off, big, huge shallow depth of field fall off there. And even the foreground there, look at the potatoes in the front, nicely shallow and nicely out of focus. So we are getting some really good isolation with him in there. Uh, let's see here. Let's go to another. Oh, same same environment. <laughs> I love this. She's kind of making sure she's sleeping or what she's doing back there. But uh, there we go. Another another in that same market. I just I love this when you're doing really trying to show off kind of a shallow depth of field look. Layering the photo. It's not just about the foreground and the background. You know, if we look at a photo like um, like here, right? He's in the foreground. The background's clearly out of focus. Okay, but there's no third layer. It's just those two layers in there. But then you look at a picture like this. And you've got this nice out of focus foreground layer that really accentuates just how much shallow depth of field we have. Then of course she's sharp and it falls off again in the background, which is which is really really nice. So uh, Martin's saying I've always looked to get the background out of focus, never thought of the foreground. But wow, your pictures just opened my eyes to something different. Creative differences, awesome. Thank you. I'm glad that we can uh, share some different creative ideas here. Yeah, I think having layering or framing, you might call it, and you'll see another photo come up here where framing is definitely what was in mind, where having that foreground element out of focus really does add depth to the image. And I don't just mean depth like depth of field depth, but that you feel like you're more part of the scene. You really are kind of involved, in, and in one case, you're going to see quite literally looking through a window, um, and that foreground stuff is out of focus. You just feel a little bit more like you're there, I think. It's just one of those little, one of those little things. You see it a lot in video, especially. Uh, it can really, a good video that has something in the foreground that's out of focus really can set that shot apart from one where it's just your subject and something behind them. So let's go back over to the images here. Uh, let's see here. So then how about just some stuff, just product or, or uh, I don't know, in this case, it's just a knife and a fork sitting there, but it, I just, it looks nice, right? I mean, they're really, again, really shallow depth. You can clearly see, zoom in tight there. The tines are perfectly in focus there. The fall off is very, very quick. Uh, really, that's about the only thing that's in focus in there. Very narrow. If, if you look along the table there, it's a very narrow band that's in focus. So that really goes to show just how narrow that focus is. Obviously, the closer you are to the subject, the narrow, narrower, more narrow, narrower that band of focus is going to be. But in a situation like this, it works out really, really nice. I think that works great. All right, let's see here. So there's some of those. Oh, just other market shots like fish market. You know, just stuff, right? And this probably is not even wide open. No, it's not. So that's at f3.5. So here we're not wide open, but we are getting that, uh, still getting some of that nice shallow depth of field look in there. So 
So, see, for those of you who say you can't do shallow depth of field with micro four thirds, people clearly don't know what they're talking about. That's even at 3.5, not even anywhere near wide open. Uh, here's an example, just kind of commercial type work. This is portraits for a local garage that I do uh, do headshots for, and uh, this is f2.2, so not totally wide open. You know, we're not trying to be artsy about it. I want to make sure that he is in focus. We have full focus on his face. I don't want to make his nose out of focus or anything like that. But we look at the background, and the background is clearly nicely out of focus. He is separated from that quite nicely there. So nice and easy type of thing to do. Uh, let's see here. Another portrait, studio portrait. That's probably, oh yeah, that's F11. So here, just to show big studio lighting type of a thing, you can see how sharp that is. I mean, that's that's just incredible. And that's at F11. So yeah, we're probably gaining a little bit of sharpness because we are so... Uh, we're stopped down a bit, so we got really good depth of field. We're beyond hitting the sweet spot of the lens, but I think it's worth showing, just nice to look at the, even at F11, it's, it, that is incredible, right? Your stop, F11, your stop pretty far down. What does this thing go down to? F16 is the smallest. So we are one stop off from, uh, off from fully stopped down, and the lens is still this incredibly sharp. I think that's, that's pretty good. That's pretty telling right there. Let's actually look at that. Let me zoom out of that image again. Uh, yeah, I'm just edge to edge. That's beautiful. So nice. I like that. I like that. All right, so there's that. Here's the one I was talking about with other foreground, literally looking through the window in there. So uh, this was a dance school. Um, the girl's obviously doing her makeup using her phone. Love that. I'm looking, uh, I'm just kind of looking through the window going by. Maybe a little bit creepy, but, um, you know, it was a great shot. And whatever. <laughs> uh, sometimes you do things you're probably not supposed to, but it made for a great picture. Uh, let's see here. No more portraits. Love this. This is in Georgia. Actually, so is that last picture. It was also in Georgia. Republic of Georgia, that is. So let's bring that up. Let's go back to full screen on there. Um, nice shallow on her. Lovely old face. Oh, this, oh, I brought in the wrong picture. This is supposed to be a black and white conversion. Love that photo in black and white. But again, nice sharp on her. Nice fall off to the background in there. Um, here's an example. Here's the one I wanted to show. It's not a great picture. It's not even straight. It obviously did a brilliant job here. I think this is one where I was trying to find an angle where I didn't have the people in it, but I brought it in here to show because clearly I'm focused on that, and yet here in the foreground, the people are nicely, slightly out of focus. Not, you know, massively out of focus, but they're slightly out of focus. And that, let's see, that is shot wide open at f1.2. So that's, I'm using that lens as a longer lens, not, obviously not for portrait, but to try and obscure some of the foreground clutter and make that a little bit a uh, little bit softer in the foreground there. So I think I like how that one works. Uh, let's see here. Um, casual snap portrait, just a you know, found situation. Beautiful little girl looking through the candles. So we got the nice candles framing there, nicely out of focus. This wedding that was happening, this is a church, uh, in quite a famous church, I suppose, in Georgia. And uh, I guess there's just kind of weddings all day long there, people coming to get married. So again, framing the foreground with those candles. Um, I like this one a lot too. Really, you can really see the the nice depth in there, the nice difference between the foreground and the background. Really sets her, she's really set apart from the background in there. Looks pretty, looks pretty. Don't you think? It's nice, right? Really nice, nice shallow depth of field with this lens. Super, super sharp, which is obviously critical. You know, shallow depth of field, but it, if there's nothing that's really, really sharp, it's not gonna be any good. This lens is giving that to you, giving that crazy, crazy sharpness um, and giving you a nice shallow depth of field, even as we saw all the way down at F11. Martin says, you love Red Square when you visit it. It's cool. I didn't have enough time there. I got to go back to Russia. Uh, okay, so let's go back and see what else we've got in here. Uh, well, a few of these photos you've seen before, because this is stuff from my Oaxaca workshop last year. Uh, but again, these are all shot with the Noctocron. So not a portrait, but I mean, it's probably not even wide open. I'm sure this isn't because quite a lot in focus, but just love the color rendering of this. Now, this is obviously treated in Lightroom as well, but um, just love the rendering of that. And then these portraits, these close-ups, so just this face, what a face. Look at that. Super sharp on his eyes. He just looks fantastic. Love it. Love it, love it, love it. A couple shots in there for you. Um, <laughs> couldn't be happier. Could not be happier. And uh, and then some wedding. Oh, that's, I really enjoy, I like this wedding shot a lot. So again, there's that foreground out of focus element kind of peeking through. Um, really nice colors in there and probably not quite wide open. Maybe we'll take a look. And uh, of course the, the eyelashes in there, the eye being the focus point. Let's just see if I zoom out of this. Oh, there's F1.2, so that one is wide open there as well. So a little bit farther away, uh, zoom back out, a little bit farther away, not quite as close. So we don't have quite as shallow depth of field, but again, clearly hands, the fall off is there. The girl doing the makeup is totally out of focus. This 
whatever table thing it was there is out of focus and we have that nice shot of her with a beautiful window light. And I was talking about a lucky shot. That was like, that was perfect sitting by the window. I actually shot some through the window first and it's like, oh, I'll bet if I go on the, on the other side, I'll get something nice and sure enough. Love it. It was one of my favorite pictures from the wedding. It was before the wedding even started. So, so there you go. Some different things in there. Uh, some different types of shots. Just showing off some of my favorite pictures with this lens. I would love to show you some video shot on this lens, but I have no way to identify the video shot with it. And I don't necessarily recall offhand, oh, that shot was shot with this lens. Um, it's one of those metadata issues. It really sucks, frankly. I wish that that metadata made it all the way through. As far as I know, the metadata is in the file, but Final Cut doesn't show it. I don't know if Premiere does. Somebody who's a Premiere user, let me know, or, um, or anything else out there. Are there any video apps that show you what lens it was shot with? Because I'm sure the metadata is there. And maybe I'm wrong about that, but uh, it's always one of those annoying things. So I don't have any video to show you, but it doesn't take much of an imagination to imagine video with that really shallow depth of field on that beautiful lens. So that's that. All right, let's take a look, quick look at the comments, and then we're going to knock out of here. Let's see. Any, uh, if you have any questions, again, make sure you put out Photo Joseph in front of it. That'll allow me to see that you have a question for me, and we can address it. So good morning, everybody who's here. <laughs> Just saying she's trained you well. That's, that's uh, in reference to the Google conversation we were having beforehand. Uh, G9, we talked about that already. The B&H pricing, we talked about that. Um, Ani Majic is saying B&H is definitely 1397. So that's that is a great, great price. Great price. Uh, Brent says they have a used 42.5. So I assume, we're, yeah, B&H for 11.49. Hey, you know that's that's actually a really good point. I'm glad that you mentioned that. Uh, obviously, only one of you can snag that deal. But buying used on lenses is great as long as the glass is clean, as long as there's no scratches in it, or if there are, if there is any damage on the glass, as long as you're aware of it and you're okay with what's what's wrong with it, it's a great way to save a lot of money on your lenses. The outside can be beat to hell, who cares? As long as the glass is clean, you're good to go. You can save a lot of money buying lenses that way. Or what I always like to recommend to people, don't forget that you can rent. There's all kinds of rental houses. If you buy B&H, you can rent from there, but uh, lens, was it borrowlenses.com and lensrentals.com? I think those are the two big online rental houses. I've used both of them. I don't have any affiliation with either of them. Although actually, now that I say that, if you rent anything from them, try the code PHOTOJOSEPH. You might get a discount. I kind of think one of them set up a discount for me at some point. I don't remember. Anyway, use PHOTOJOSEPH. Maybe you'll get lucky and it'll knock a percentage off. But renting any gear, but especially a lens, because a lot of the best lenses, well, for obvious reasons, are quite expensive. And if you don't need it all the time, with the 100 to 400 Leica lens is a really good example of that. That's not a cheap lens, and it is not a lens that most people need all the time. It's the kind of thing that you're going to use once or twice a year, or use on a trip, or use for a particular shoot. So rent it for that duration. Save yourself a ton of money. And uh, when, it's, when you're done, you just sip it back. I, it's a great way to do it. It's also a great way to just try it. Do I really want to spend 2000 or whatever is a 1400 now on this lens? That's a lot of money. Do I really want to spend the money? Rent it. Spend 50 bucks or whatever it's going to cost to rent it for a day or a weekend and uh, get your hands on it, shoot with it, and see what you think. And that's the best way to make the decision. And then that little extra money that you spent, you will you will be okay with spending that little bit of extra because you'll have the confidence buying it that it was totally worth your purchase. So, so there's that. All right, let's go back to the comments here. Uh, Tyler says, were you using auto or manual focus? I switch back and forth all the time depending on what I'm doing. When I'm doing portraits, it's usually autofocus uh, for... And I usually you leave it in face detection mode because it, if here, okay, here's, this is a great, actually another great question. So let's talk about that. I usually have my camera in autofocus face detection mode, even if I'm not shooting faces. Why? Because as soon as, when the camera does not find a face in the scene, it reverts to the 255 area focus. So the whole scene becomes fair game for focusing. If I want to focus on a particular area that the camera is not grabbing, then I know that I can just grab the focus point, and I can do that either with a joystick, if you've got one of the cameras that do that, or even with a joystick, what I tend to do more is I use the touchpad on the back of the camera as the focus point. I believe I've done a video on that already. If I, if I have, we'll link to it right here. If when I point to this, nothing comes up, that means that I haven't done a video on that. I'm pretty sure I have. Uh, and I will do one. I'll do one later because setting that up as a focus thing is kind of awesome. So we'll, we can talk about that in another video. Um, so that I will control where the camera is going to autofocus using that. And then it's just one push of the menu button to reset it. So it goes back to its default state of looking for the face. Or if it's not a face, then whatever subject the camera deems is most important. Clearly, there are times to go manual. Uh, if I'm shooting video, honestly, I'm usually shooting video in manual focus. And if I'm if I'm doing critical focus on stills, if the camera's on a tripod, and then I'll just go into manual focus because 
I don't want things to move. I can just dial it in, zoom in really close, maybe use focus peaking if it's a little bit hard to tell and, uh, and focus that way. So great question. Thank you. All right. Martin says, uh, oh, he was talking about the focus in the foreground. We already talked about that. Let's see what else is going on in here. And Brent says, as a multiple GH5 and soon-to-be GH5S owner, sweet, um, and many Panasonic lenses, would a G9 offer significant advantages for stills? I tend to also shoot behind-the-scenes stills while on some video shoots. Well, for behind-the-scenes, I don't think you really need a G9 for behind-the-scenes. I mean, for most of that, you know, your iPhone's probably good enough. But the advantages of stills are... Um, I'm so funny. I, I, I should have like comparison spec sheets because I do these shows a month ago and I forget what the differences are. Uh, G9, you clearly have that. You have that high resolution mode, which is awesome if you want that, the, where it stitches things together into a 40, 50 megapixel, some big honking image. Um, you get the faster frame rate if you really need a really high frame rate on there. You do have that option. It's, uh, I really like that you have a couple of different speed controls on the back that you can switch between. So you can pre-program it however you want that, but shooting at that like 20 frame per second or whatever it is, burst is insane if you need that level of speed. Um, there's a few other, I think it's a little bit faster. It's a little faster autofocus for still photography than the GH5. Um, ideally sports, if you're a sports action shooter, then it's definitely a camera to be looking at. If it's just kind of casual behind the scenes stills type stuff, I don't think you're going to really see an advantage of this camera over the GH5 that you already have. So, yeah, I'm, unless you're shooting big action sports type stuff, it's probably not going to give you much of a benefit. Of course, if you want that super high resolution option, then it's the only way to go. Um, if you want 20 frames per second, it's the only way to go. But there you go. All righty. Uh, let's see here. Martin says you loved Red Square. It was awesome. I got to get back there some more. Uh, Brent says, oops, Sony Catalyst does sometime. I'm not sure what you're talking about there, Brent. Sorry if you can want to repeat that. Uh, uh, Torbjorn says, how fast is the autofocus? Fast. Uh, you measure that. Point, what is it, 0 0.04 seconds or something or the, the claim stats. Obviously, it all depends on what you're shooting, if things moving, not moving. But for still photography, I mean, it's it really is hard to beat these. I know that the cameras have a bit of a bad rap for autofocus for video. I get it. But for stills, it's pretty lightning quick. I'm going to be shooting a basketball game in two more weekends, I think it is. I think it's in two weeks, uh, where I'm going to take the G9 and uh, and take my longer lenses. Well, I'll take a bunch of lenses and go shoot. It's college basketball, and that'll give me some more semblance of how it performs in that type of a situation. So that's coming up uh, in a few weeks or so. Uh, let's see here. Martin Pitt says, Filmora, which for a cheap bit of software gives meta, meta video, meta video, metadata on video. Okay, Filmora. Thank you, Martin Pitt. I will check that out. Sir says, EXIF tool shows metadata for video. Does it? Oh, I didn't know that. I have EXIF tool. It shows metadata for video files. My previous message was the URL was hidden from the chat. Oh, just Google EXIF tool. Yeah, EXIF tool by Phil Harvey. Um, yeah, that's. I do have that tool on here. So that's good to know. I don't think, I didn't know that it did video. That's awesome. Perfect. Uh, Ryan, well, don't worry about it. Uh, you just Google, anybody watching this, Google EXIF tool, and we'll put a link to that down below as well. Um, there you go. Let's see here. Trevor's saying, if manual focus is something you're interested in, you need a manual lens for the best results. Panasonic lenses are not manual lenses, and they perform, and the performance will be variable as a result. Okay, so here's what he's talking about. And it's a fair point, but I wouldn't go as far as saying that you need a manual focus lens if you want to do manual focus. All of these lenses are focused by wire. They're not mechanical, meaning that when I turn this, it is not turning a gear that is directly connected to the lens that is turning the lens. It is drive by wire, focus by wire. It's an electronic feedback. When I turn this, the camera says he's turning it this direction at this speed. Therefore, I'm going to adjust the lens focus this much. The advantage of it is if you turn the lens really slow, slow it, it slows down the focusing. So you get very precise focusing. If I do a very quick rack like this, it's going to rack most of the way through the focus because even though if it was mechanical, it would require five turns, by doing it quickly like this, the camera senses the speed and it adjusts the focus accordingly. It makes it, I think it's great for manual focus most of the time, but fair point, there are times where that having it as a pure mechanical focus would be to your advantage. I have lenses that do both. I have some non-Panasonic lenses that have mechanical focus. They are great for certain uses and in other uses, I prefer the electronic. Obviously you have what you have. You, know, you can't change it on the lens. If you love a lens, you learn to live with it and you just learn to focus with it. Um, I've like I said, I do most of my video in manual focus. Most of my video is shot through these lenses. It works great. Yes, there are times where the mechanical would be better, but 
don't feel like just because you're shooting manual focus that you can't do it with these lenses. I think it's a little bit extreme. They work perfectly fine. It's just a different feel. Okay, uh, Sharp as L says, do ND filters cut down quality at all for you as far as you can tell? Okay, that's gonna depend on the quality of the ND filter. Like anything else, it's all about the quality of what you put into it. You can buy a $20 ND filter, you can buy a couple hundred dollar ND filter. I have been using a quite inexpensive one from Fotga, I believe it is. I think that's the one. And I, I haven't done a, a critical comparison, but it's fine. I haven't had any issues with it. Let's, let's put it that way. I haven't had any issues with it. I've never looked at the image and gone, oh, well, that's a little soft because the ND filter or a little smudgy or whatever. Um, the variable ND filters, as they get to their darkest settings, can tend to get a little weird and blotchy, especially the cheaper ones. But I have a couple of ND filters from, like I said, there's really cheap Fotga, like 20 bucks or something ones, up to maybe 100-ish dollar ones. And uh, I haven't done critical comparison to see the difference. I'm sure there is a difference. You always get what you pay for when it comes to this stuff. But uh, for a lot of use, you know, you get away with a cheap one, no problem. No problem. All right, let's see what else is here in the chat. Anything else? Uh, Serge, oh, talking about EXIF tool, does for MP4. The file includes a JPEG of the first frame of video with all the EXIF information. Oh, no kidding. I didn't know that. Serge is saying that the MP4 video files contain a JPEG of the first frame of video with the EXIF information. Huh. Go figure. I never heard that before. Cool. I wonder if a .mov is the same or if it's just an MP4 thing. Very cool. Tyler says, on the focus by wire subject, do you think it would be something Panasonic would consider to do a video and photo mode where they throw, where they throw constant for video and longer for photo. That's an interesting question, Tyler. That's a very good question. Technically, I guess it would be possible, right? Where it's a more consistent. I'm going to ask. I like that. I like that idea. If there's a way, it'd be just by a firmware update or software thing in the camera to tell the lens to focus on a more consistent? That's a really interesting question. Okay, I'm gonna ask that. Thank you for mentioning that. I think that's great. <laughs> Super. Ben says, I wish Panasonic would give an actual focus distance readout option. Surely just a former issue. Yeah, that's come up before. Um, I don't know why it's not there. It's come up before. Don't really have a good answer for you. Flyvision UK says, hi from the UK. Hello back. Hello, apologies if you're repeating something. <clears throat> Excuse me if this, uh, this isn't for here. Did you get did you get the same with photo style settings between video mode and APA? Uh, oh, were you asking that in a comment, weren't you? I, I got to look that up. Uh, ask me that about that one later. He's asking about the photo style switching between video and still modes, whether the photo style switches with it. I don't remember. It's something I got to look up. Someone asked that in a comment. It might have been you. Uh, in a, in a, that vision message was from you. Okay. All right, guys. So there's that. That is all there is to it today. Thanks a bunch for tuning in. I hope that uh, that was enjoyable. I know some of you enjoy seeing the photos, so that's awesome always. And uh, yeah, again, if it's in your budget, I get it. This lens is expensive. It's not for everybody, but it is a thing of beauty. If if you can swing it, it is definitely worth every penny. It is a gorgeous lens. And if you do things like weddings, it's kind of a must have. Uh, if you shoot portraits for a living, you shoot weddings, it's kind of, you just got to have it. It's just that perfect lens for that sort of thing. So I hope that was fun and interesting, educational and informational. Enjoy the rest of your week, folks. We'll see you back here on Wednesday. Bye-bye.